This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar series. Today's webinar is breast and back pain and is sponsored by Realty3. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. And your questions will remain anonymous as always. Today's presenters are Dr. Ben Eliahu, Caitlin Conville, and Melissa Hafner. Dr. Ben Eliahu is the Administrative Director of the Back Pain Center at Mather Hospital and Director of the Mather Chiropractic Collaboration Program. He has advanced certifications in sports injuries and pain management. Dr. Ben Eliahu has been in private practice in Selden, New York for 34 years where he directs an integrated and collaborative spine and musculoskeletal practice. Caitlin Conville is a nurse practitioner and program coordinator for the Back and Neck Pain Center. She received her Master of Science from Stony Brook University after completing their family nurse practitioner program. She joined the Back and Neck Pain Center from the inpatient side of Mather Hospital, where she worked in orthopedics for over four years. Melissa Hafner is an assistant director of Mather Hospital's outpatient physical therapy program. She received her Bachelor of Science and her master's degree in physical therapy from Mercy College in Westchester, New York. She's worked at Mather as a physical therapist for 14 years. Dr. Ben, you can go ahead and get us started today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our monthly webinars. As Emily just said, today's topic is going to be about the relationship between stress and back pain. Next slide. So in a recent study, 29% of U.S. adults believe that stress and anxiety has caused their back pain. And another study in general hospital psychiatry, patients with stress were twice as more likely to have chronic back pain. Some general statistics about back pain, 80% of all Americans will experience a back problem at some point in their life. 10% uh, of the world's population suffers from low back pain. It is the leading cause of global disability in the world. Women suffer from back pain more than men. Uh, it obviously becomes greater and more common as we get older due to wear and tear in our joints and our spine. And 29% of Americans, as I said, believe that stress is related to their back pain. As we'll demonstrate today, there's a very strong relationship between mind and body. Next. So you can see this poor woman is being stressed out beyond belief. So why do we develop stress, anxiety, and depression? Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, as you can see from the the right side. Um, sometimes we work just way too much. We put way too many high expectations on ourselves, um, financial issues, job stressors, loss of a job, family or marital problems, societal issues, and so on and so forth. Um, you can see there's a host of reasons, and typically um, this can definitely cause a lot, of, a lot of stress and cause a lot of pain. Next. So what are the effects of stress on the body? So a stressor um, will cause a portion of our nervous system to become overreactive. It's called the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system, if some of you have heard this before, is the one responsible for the fight or flight response. So given a very stressful situation, our sympathetic nervous system will actually react to it. And flight means we'll confront it or flight means we'll run away from it. But either way, those stressors lead the body to produce a hormone called cortisol. It's like a cortisone that our own body produces. And as we prepare for that emergency, whatever it may be, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, our body will react physiologically with an increased heart rate, increased muscle tension. And for purposes of today's discussion, when we're under a lot of stress and there's a lot of muscle tension, um, as the muscles get really tight, looking at your shoulders and your traps, I'm exaggerating, but essentially this is what happens. This is relaxed. 
and this is contracted. We're under a lot of stress, our muscles are very tense, and unfortunately, muscles connect to bone. So as that muscle does this, it actually pulls on the neck bones, it pulls on the upper back bones, and the longer that stays there, not only can the muscle cause pain, but as it pulls on the spine joints, it can cause neck pain and back pain as well. So chronic stress can definitely put a lot of strain on your spine. Next. So here you can see that it doesn't just affect our skeletal system, it affects lots of issues in our body, lots of physiological processes. It can affect our skin, uh, it can affect our stomach. I mean, think about someone who is in a lot, a lot of stressful situation, and as a result, they start to develop uh, extra you know, acid production, they start to get gastroesophageal reflux. Sometimes if left long enough, it can actually go on to become an ulcer. It can affect your intestines, obviously it can cause heart disease, increase blood pressure, tachycardia or increased heartbeat, um, and put people at risk for developing um, strokes and, and heart attacks. And then lastly, <clears throat> as we discussed, joints and inflammation of the muscles, because of what I described before, stress causes muscles to contract, muscles contract, pull on bones, pull, bones being pulled can pull on nerves, and it can create a vicious cycle, creating musculoskeletal pain, as well as spine pain. Next. So here's the uh, pain cycle. And you can see the pain cycle starts with psychological stress up on your right-hand corner, which can cause pain, cause muscle spasm, which we talked about. Now the muscles are pulling so hard. If these muscles are like this, it can restrict how much you can move your neck in flexion, extension, and rotation. As those joints become restricted, it affects the muscle again, and now it decreases function. And then you can see the circle just keeps going on and on. So stress is something that has to be handled. Now, you can't get rid of stress in life. Life is stress. Um, from the moment we're born to the day we die, we are going to be dealing with stress. So it's not about getting rid of stress. There is no getting rid of stress. It's about how you recognize it and about how you deal with it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Next. So we talked about back pain, cause and effect. Um, stress and tension can cause a lot of muscle issues as we discussed. And you can kind of get effect from looking at the skeleton, how it can affect the neck, the middle back, the lower back, and having a lot to do with how the muscles pull on the spine joints. Next slide. And then lastly, posture. So how you sit. Now we're all, you know, with this whole pandemic thing, a lot of us have been working from home, we're working on our computers. And as we slouch, that puts a lot of stress um, on the back from right to left. Now I'm gonna let um, our nurse practitioner at our program at Mather Hospital at the Back and Neck Pain Center take over at this point. And she's gonna discuss a whole bunch of things that are stress-related issues. Caitlin? All right, hi everyone. Um, can I just have the next slide, please? <clears throat> All right, so my name is Caitlin Conville. I'm the nurse practitioner at the Back and Neck Pain Center. And I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit about mental health and stress. So as Dr. Ben Eliyahu said, stress can have a significant effect on both your physical and emotional well-being. Um, now there are many signs and symptoms that indicate that you could be experiencing chronic stress and that is having a negative effect and um, negative impact on your daily life. So some of the emotional symptoms of chronic stress include things like irritability, anxiety, depression, um, lack of motivation, restlessness and moodiness. And some of the physical symptoms of chronic stress include things like headaches, insomnia, high blood pressure, digestive issues or changes, um, change in sex drive and muscle pain and tension. Next slide. So now that we know some of the ways that chronic stress can negatively affect our well-being, how can we work to reduce our stress levels on a daily basis? So some of the ways that we can minimize stress include things like setting a schedule. So putting your plans on paper can show you how realistic they are with your time availability. Um, and that can help you see if you're trying to do too much. So by making a schedule, you can evaluate what a doable schedule would look like and then just make adjustments to your activity accordingly. So this can also allow you time to carve out, um, you know, some rest, decompress and self care time in between activities. Um, eating a healthy diet, <clears throat> exercising regularly, both of which we'll talk about later. Developing good sleep habits. Um, sleep loss can make it harder to uh, manage your blood sugar and stress levels. So you should try to aim for seven to eight hours of sleep to keep your blood sugar, appetite and stress at normal levels. Um, developing a support system. So having people around you who can support you on a daily basis. Um, changing your expectations. So it's really easy to get overwhelmed by too many activities and responsibilities when you're trying to do it all. 
Um, trying to, by deciding what activities offer the most positive impact on your life, you can eliminate those activities that weigh you down um, and spend your time engaging in things that you actually enjoy and that have a positive effect on your well being. Uh, stress reduction therapy, like mindfulness based stress reduction, which we're going to review a little bit more in detail on the next slide. Um, and then just breathing, meditation, and yoga, which we'll also review. All right. So mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy is a meditation therapy designed for stress management. So this type of therapy aims to address the unconscious thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that can increase stress and undermine your health. It is used for treating a variety of illnesses, including depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Um, and just some examples of techniques that are used in mindfulness-based stress, stress reduction therapy include things like deep breathing, um, body scan meditation, walking meditation, mindful stretching and yoga. Next slide. All right, so here are two examples of some mind-body tools that we recommend to decrease stress and promote mental wellness. So on the left here, we have body skin meditation, which has many benefits, including stress relief, um, improved sleep and reduced pain. So in order to perform a body scan meditation, you would take 10 nice deep breaths to relax, and then you'd focus all of your sensations and energy um, on each part of your body, starting in your head and going all the way to your feet, one body part at a time. And then you would go right back up, okay? And it just promotes mental awareness um, and, and relaxation. So on the right here, we have some examples of yoga poses that can be performed while seated at home or even in your office. Um, and these can help to reduce stress and are also useful for those experiencing muscle pains in their back or neck. Next slide. All right, the role of diet and nutrition. So now I'd like to talk to you about diet and nutrition. So on the left here, we have an example of foods that are not the healthiest foods in the world, um, foods that promote inflammation in the body and promote weight gain uh, while providing very few nutritional benefits. So on the right, you can see fresh, colorful produce, uh, foods that are high in antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals, and serve to reduce inflammation in the body. Research shows that our diet plays a significant role in inflammation and pain in the body. Um, inflammation is an important underlying mechanism for the development of chronic disease, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and cancer. Um, and increased inflammation in the body is also found in patients with chronic pain. So by recognizing foods that can reduce inflammation, um, as well as to promote inflammation, we can make some diet modifications that can decrease inflammation in the body overall and help to reduce pain. All right, so I'm just going to review with you the anti-inflammatory diet. So on the left here, we have the food pyramid for the Mediterranean diet. Um, this is an anti-inflammatory diet that provides an excellent guideline for how to make diet modifications that will reduce inflammation in the body. Um, so as I said, inflammation in the body is positively or negatively affected by the foods we eat. So some pro-inflammatory foods or foods that increase inflammation in the body include things like saturated fats. Um, that's, those are found in red meat, um, whole fat dairy products, uh, trans fats, which are found in hydrogenated oils used to make processed or packaged baked goods, crackers, chips, um, omega-6 fatty acids, which are found in oils such as corn oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, um, and in sugar and sugar-laden foods. Now, some anti-inflammatory foods, which we want to focus on to help reduce inflammation markers in the body, include foods high in things like omega-3 fatty acids, um, which can be found in canola oil and walnuts, um, monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil, avocado, nuts, um, fruits and vegetables, and whole grains, more colorful the better, and many different herbs, spices, and teas. Next slide. All right, so the role of exercise. So Oftentimes we do not get enough exercise as a population, especially in this country. Um, exercise is important in the prevention and management of back pain as it can lead to the weakened, lack of exercise can lead to the weakening of muscles uh, that provide support to your back. So a lack of core strength, um, which is something that, you know, physical therapists typically deal with on a regular basis. And we'll hear from our physical therapists later. Um, that's a common cause of low back pain. So. I'm sorry, just jump back, thanks. <laughs> so exercise um, can also make us feel good by leading to the release of endorphins. Um, endorphins relieve stress, muscle tension, and improve mood and sleep. Um, making sure that we exercise in a safe way for our bodies and incorporating things like stretching, strengthening, and cardiovascular exercise into our daily routines can help us to maintain our overall health, our stress levels, and they can help to improve back or neck pain. So as a preventative measure, regular exercise is key. 
Um, if you do experience back or neck pain, it can be really helpful to work with a provider, such as a physical therapist, um, to develop a safe and appropriate exercise plan for your condition. Um, and now I'm just going to hand the presentation back over to Dr. Ben Eliyahu, who's going to review with you what you can do if you experience pain in your back or neck. Thank you, Caitlin. So obviously stress, as we've demonstrated, can definitely lead to musculoskeletal issues, including back and neck pain. So what do you do at home if you develop this? Well, at home, things that you can do are obviously rest for a little bit, use ice in an acute situation, use moist heat. Physical therapy is often helpful, chiropractic, acupuncture, and massage. Um, we offer a pretty good service regarding helping people with back and neck pain. And then there are sometimes serious injuries that are called red flags. That means you should go to the emergency room um, if the pain has gotten so bad and it's accompanied by these red flag signs, which is a fever, um, bowel and bladder dysfunction, you've lost control, uh, numbness in your um, perineum area, major motor weakness where you can't walk well because your legs are giving way, progressive numbness in your leg, or just severe and unrelenting pain to the point where you just can't function. Um, that's, that's something that's called the red flag and you should go to the emergency room. Next slide. So just to clear up differences between ice and heat, generally um, we recommend ice for up to 48 to 72 hours after an acute episode of pain or an acute injury. Um, never use heat in the beginning. Uh, there's usually an inflammation that occurs in the beginning. So you always want to use an ice pack and you want to use an ice pack or a bag of ice and make sure that you have a barrier between your skin and the ice. You can use a wet dish towel, a uh, wet washcloth, wet paper towel, um, and then just make sure you don't leave it on too long so you don't get a burn. Moist heat, we generally start to use after 72 hours and it should be moist because it helps to reduce tightness, it helps to reduce muscle stiffness, it increases blood flow, and it also makes the muscles a lot looser, which helps, especially for people who are having stress because their muscles tend to be tight to begin with. Um, so heat is very good in subacute and chronic situations. So if you've had back problems for a long time, moist heat is what you should be using, not dry heat. A dry heating pad can't penetrate beyond the level of the skin. So you always need to use like a wet heating pad or a moist heat application. Next slide. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things in a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about different aspects of you've had a lot of stress, you've developed back problems, you've developed sciatica or neck pain and headaches. Um, we're going to talk about different options, what to do with that once you've developed that. But there's a tool that we always use as spine clinicians. Um, it's called the Functional Disability Index, and this is what you're looking at. We report to insurance companies and to Medicare with this tool all the time because it actually looks at function. So what I want everybody to do for the next 30 seconds is just take a quick look at these questions and then just kind of note how many you answered. There's about nine of them. And just we'll come back to this at the end and we'll talk about how functional disability affects the quality of one's life. Um, and I just want everybody to kind of at the end put in their number. So just we'll give you 30 more seconds to just kind of notate in your head how many you answered yes to. And then on the bottom, there is a Q&A area where you can just type in how many, and it's anonymous, you can just type in what your score was, one, two, eight, nine, whatever it was. So 20 more seconds and we'll move on. Okay, next slide. So here are some common reasons anatomically from a body point of view of what can cause problems with the neck and back. And again, stress is related because if you're under a lot of stress, your muscles have been tight. Um, you probably have been sitting at your desk working or surfing the computer. And that posture of sitting all the time puts a tremendous load on the joints of the back. So we can get joint and arthritic problems. If you look at the far left, the red circles are pointing to the joints of the spine, so you can get facet joint issues. When we go to the middle slide, we call this sciatica. I notice the pink stippled area on the right leg. Now, sciatica means pain in the leg. That's all it means. It means that the sciatic nerve has been pinched. And what can cause the pinched sciatic nerve? Most commonly, a protruding, a bulging disc or a herniated disc, which is the second picture 
next to the sciatic one. And you can see that the disc material has moved from the middle and it's actually compressing the nerve. So that's a really common reason for why people will develop sciatica. And if you're under a lot of stress, there's a particular muscle that can go into spasm. It's called the piriformis muscle. And on the far right, you can see that the piriformis muscle sits right over the sciatic nerve. And if you're sitting a long time at the computer or you sit a lot, um, that can actually make that muscle tight and can actually cause compression of that nerve. And that can lead to sciatica type symptoms. So we have mechanical problems. Like on the left, we showed you the lumbar facet joints. Underneath it is the sacroiliac joint that's in the pelvis. We have nerve problems and muscle problems. Next slide. So types of treatment that are effective for reducing uh, stress-associated back and neck pain are physical therapists and chiropractors. And we're going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about what they each have to offer and the strengths of what they offer. Next slide. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit as an expert in chiropractic care. I've been practicing for many, many years, a lot of experience. And um, I've also had experience not only here working at Mather Hospital in our spine center, but I've also had a lot of experience working in a national scope. Um, I was selected to be part of the Olympic Medical Society, and I had the opportunity to work collaboratively with lots of different physicians and helping people with back-related issues. Next slide. So what is chiropractic care? Some of you may have been to a chiropractor, some of you may never have been to a chiropractor, but generally a good chiropractor focuses on the spine and the musculoskeletal system. Um, chiropractic has come a long way over the last 20 years. There's been a ton of research now that has shown in random controlled clinical trials that it's highly effective for back pain. It's gone pretty much 180 degrees. You know, if you had asked somebody from the AMA what they thought about a chiropractor 25 years ago, they obviously would have said, uh, yeah, we don't believe in it, don't go to one. But in reality, what's happened over the last two decades is there's been a tremendous amount of research, as I said. And now what's happened is the AMA actually recommends chiropractic medicine as a first line approach for mechanical back pain. Um, chiropractors recommend therapeutic exercises, postural guidance, dietary life guidance as well. Um, and we have many chiropractors associated with the hospital. Next slide. So what happens to a visit with the chiropractor? Like any doctor you go to, we take a history, do a physical exam. We'll generally order x-rays and MRIs if it's necessary, create a treatment plan that includes some of the modalities that we spoke about and review everything with you and keep it a patient-centered decision where we kind of keep you in the loop as far as deciding what we're gonna do and what kind of treatment plan we're gonna manage. Next. So chiropractors do a host of things. Um, if you've been to a chiropractor, you know that chiropractors do spinal manipulation, but spinal manipulation doesn't have to be limited to just that cracking thing that you see on that middle picture on the right column. Um, some patients shouldn't ever have that type of manipulation. They have things like rheumatoid arthritis or osteoporosis. I would never use that technique on someone with those conditions. So the art of being good at being a chiropractor is knowing what to use with whom. Um, there's particular types of techniques, like you can see on the middle, the guy's holding a tool in his hand. It's a mechanically assisted device. It's almost like a plunger that clicks the joint. Uh, we do a lot of myofascial work. We work on trigger points. We do techniques like infrared laser, inferential stimulation. And on the bottom, top hand, on right hand corner, you'll see a traction device. Next slide. So this chiropractor is using a Cox table. This is one of the things I use almost exclusively. It helps to reduce disc problems and disc herniations. Sitting at a desk a long time, injuries to a disc can cause herniations or bulges. Uh, and the table gently moves, <clears throat> excuse, moves up and down. The doctor's left hand is going up and down. Same thing happens with the neck. The table moves very gently up and down into flexion, and it causes centrifugal force to actually reduce the disc herniation. If you look on the bottom right, these are images from a study I actually published. You can actually see on the left with the before treatment, the disc is sticking out pretty well in that red circle. And notice that on the right after treatment that the disc herniation actually resorbed. Next slide. And then the same thing with necks. Now the neck manipulation on the left, that's the one where the neck is rotated and actually makes that clicking noise. And by the way, if you've ever been to a chiropractor, the clicking noise is nothing more than gas escaping from a joint, very much like a soda can. If you open a soda can, it'll create a pop noise. And that's all the noises when a manipulation is done. It just creates a pop noise because this uh, gas actually escapes from the joint. That doesn't mean it should be done on everybody. There's lots of reasons why we shouldn't do this. People who have spinal stenosis, people who have uh, inflammatory arthropathies, people have osteoporosis or somebody just doesn't want to have it done. There's lots of other things that we can do, like the one on the right where that table 
headpiece is moving up and down and moving the joint very gently through ranges of motion to reestablish normal mechanics. Next slide. And then soft tissue mobilization, we massage muscles, break up knots and trigger points. Next slide. And then lastly, I mentioned this, these are two recent studies published by the AMA, by the way. So it just goes to show you how it's really come a long way. Research has shown that chiropractic medicine is very effective for back and neck pain. And that's actually the study on the right was a study show that um, on military personnel in the United States service um, that combine medical care and chiropractic care in the VA hospitals. And there's about a hundred VA hospitals across the nation that have chiropractors on staff. Um, was much better than just medicine alone. Uh, next slide. So now I'm gonna let our physical therapist, Melissa Hafner, talk about how PT can help someone with stress-related back pain. Melissa? Thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, my name is Melissa Hafner. I'm the assistant director in the outpatient area. We do see a wide variety of diagnosis in the clinic, but one particular clinic that is often associated with stress or stress-induced would be postural dysfunction. So postural dysfunction, uh, repetitive bouts of stress can cause musculoskeletal dysfunction. As Dr. Ben said earlier, when the body is stressed, it becomes tighter and inflexible, making it difficult to regain that flex or proper posture that we strive to have. So poor posture leads to faulty mechanics of your spine and then can lead to pain. Therefore, stress can cause or enhance back pain, neck pain with increased intensity and frequency. So poor posture at any level can lead to muscle imbalances. So when the muscle on one side of the body might be stronger, tighter, weaker than the corresponding muscle on the other side of the body, that's where we get these muscular imbalances. So there are common muscular imbalance patterns that we see in the clinic. There's the upper cross syndrome and the lower cross syndrome, which are both seen on the right-hand side of your screen. Often in times, these two patterns can be seen in conjunction with one another. So how do we fix this muscular imbalance caused by poor posture? As Dr. Sen Dr. Ben had said earlier, when we're stressed, we hunch forward, we get these rounded, elevated shoulders. It often leads to tight muscle groups. Um, in the pictures, they're showing you which muscle groups tend to get tight with the poor posture and which ones tend to get weak wearing. The tight, the tight muscles we have to get um, seem to be overused and have become shortened over time. We need to go in there and stretch them and mobilize those tissues. Whereas on the other hand, the elongated muscles have been inhibited, underused, and have become weak. So now they have to be facilitated into proper posture and then strengthened within that proper posture to regain their full function. The good news is it's never too late to start working on posture and proper alignment. Um, when you come to a physical therapy, there's an evaluation where a thorough sitting and standing postural assessment will be performed. Once the evaluation is performed, then we can implement a stretching and strengthening program, really focusing on the core stabilization muscles. So those core muscles are what help support the spine and endurance exercises. Uh, many of our postural muscles are utilized for prolonged time. So making endurance exercise is important to put into the equation as well. We do focus a significant amount of time on teaching postural awareness. Uh, teaching the patient and the body how to maintain, maintain that proper alignment as you go through specific movements of your day. So we often ask our patients to go home and assess when they find their bodies in poor posture or in discomfort, and that feedback helps us offer modifications or suggestions on ergonomics or postural supports they can use. So if they found when they're on the computer for a long time, they were starting to get pain or prolonged driving, we can offer a suggestion of a lumbar support or correcting the ergonomics of their workstation. Lifting techniques is something else we can review if it's while you're at work and you're lifting things, your pain starts. So the patient's feedback really dictates where the, the sessions will go. While we do offer many of the traditional treatments um, that you may have heard of or received in the past, um, therapeutic exercises is a main component to some of your treatments. We really focus on stretching and strengthening of the core stability and postural muscles. And as you progress, then we try to add some aerobic or endurance activities. Manual therapy, especially initially, um, we spoke about those tight overused or stressed muscles. 
So applying some soft tissue mobilization, myofascial release, or manual stretching can often help elongate those muscle fibers that may have shortened over time. The McKenzie method is something that we very commonly use in our clinic and we've seen great results with it. We take a patient through repeated movements um, and to counterbalance some of those stresses that poor posture can often put on your internal structures of the spine. Some examples of that would be um, a slouch overcorrection or a repeated retraction with the neck or repeated extension at the back. Depending on the patient's directional preference or what we find on your evaluation that helps reduce your pain. Modalities do find a place in the clinic. Initially, a patient may need some ice, heat, electrical stim, or traction, and those can be used in conjunction with some of the other treatment techniques that we just discussed. Once we've helped reduce your pain, improve your mobility, we do like to take a look at some functional activities, hope to get you back to the gym, returning to work, or any other activities that you may have stopped or avoided because of pain or fear of pain. As we work towards discharge and we try to change our focus more to a home exercise program, patient education, postural education, and lifting techniques, this is important because we want a patient to feel 100% confident and comfortable with their self stretches, their home exercise program, and their self care so that they can continue to perform this even when they're done with completion of their physical therapy program. So there are many be benefits to completion of a physical therapy program. Uh, many patients says it has helped jumpstart in implementing exercise into their daily routine. So many of our patients may have come to us for 45 minutes to an hour a day, two to three days a week, and now they take that time that they put aside for physical therapy and start going to the gym or implementing exercises at home. So it's important to have something lined up when you're done with therapy. Um, we've educated you on proper body mechanics for working out. This really boosts patients' confidence for instilling a, um, a, a strength training or an exercise and stretching program when they're done here because they've been informed of body mechanics. And then we hope that the physical therapy has empowered you as the patient to take ownership of your neck or back pain and your overall health as an active role in your own recovery and maintenance. So throughout your sessions, we try to educate you on your pathology or disease process so that there's a complete understanding of that there are things that you can do to help reduce your own pain and symptoms. And mostly, I hope that you understand the importance of exercise, the relationship between exercise and stress reduction, um, between what we've discussed earlier and um, what Caitlin's going to mention, there, uh, as you're exercising, your body releases endorphins, and those help to studies have shown that even five minutes of aerobic exercises can decrease your levels of tension, elevate and stabilize your mood, improve your sleep and self esteem, which overall we're hoping will break the uh, pain cycle. With that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Caitlin. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thanks, Melissa. All right, so I'm just briefly going to um, give you an overview of the Back and Neck Pain Center at Mather Hospital and tell you a little bit about how our program works. All right, so here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we provide evidence-based multidisciplinary care that's customized by our clinical team um, and our collaborating physician and guided by myself, the nurse practitioner. So when I mention multidisciplinary care, I'm referring to the fact that we have multiple providers from many different dis disciplines, um, including spine surgery, interventional pain management, physical therapy, and chiropractic, um, two of whom we've met today, um, who all work together to coordinate your care. So we meet once weekly and we review patient charts to allow for providers from different backgrounds to weigh in on the selected treatment plan and provide their, their unique perspectives. Um, at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we aim to reduce recurrent episodes of back and neck pain in the future by teaching about adopting healthy lifestyles, talking about diet and exercise, um, some of the things that we reviewed here today. Um, we also avoid the use of high-risk pain medications here. So while one of our goals uh, is to alleviate your pain, we want to find the underlying cause of your pain and provide treatment that addresses this underlying cause. 
Um, and then here at Back and Neck Pain Center, we also identify and address disparity of care factors. So there are many factors that make it difficult for individuals to access treatment. And this includes things like financial obstacles, um, transportation issues, mobility issues, comorbid medical conditions, mental health issues, and difficulty managing multiple appointments with different providers. So at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we aim to identify these factors and provide assistance to ensure that you're able to get the treatment that you need. Next slide. All right, so our step ladder approach. So this graphic depicts our approach to treatment here at the Back and Neck Pain Center. Um, we use what we like to call a step ladder approach. So with this approach, we aim to provide the least invasive effective treatment option for your condition. So for most people, this means starting with conservative treatment measures such as physical therapy or chiropractic care. Um, if you come to us and you've already tried conservative measures without improvement, or if your condition warrants further intervention, we may start, start a little bit higher on the ladder with something like interventional pain management um, or one of our support programs. In cases where you have the red flag signs or symptoms that Dr. Ben Eliyahu discussed earlier, um, things that indicate an urgent condition, we may send you directly to a surgeon. So statistically, approximately 75% of our patients improve with conservative measures, um, but we continue to evaluate you throughout the course of treatment and recommend any additional steps um, or treatment measures that we think are appropriate. Um, about 20% of our patients utilize pain management treatment options and about 5% of our patients have required spinal surgery. So our overall goal is to provide the most appropriate treatment for you um, and treatment that will be effective in reducing your pain and helping you to regain function. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Ben Eliyahu and he's just going to briefly review the results of your risk assessment with you. So if you, uh, hi there again, <clears throat> thank you, Caitlin. So if you scored that disability function index that I referred to in the beginning, generally a score of zero or one means that this is something you can manage on your own. But when you start to get into the two, three, four or greater range, that usually means that you're having a moderate disability that's affecting the quality of your life. It's affecting what you do at home, uh, your hobbies, your activities that you like to do. Um, and that means that there's some attention that needs to be paid to it. So let's just go ahead and say that the key points and the takeaway points from today, if you're having stress in your life and it's affecting your health, um, use moist heat. That's definitely helpful to reduce muscle tightness. Melissa talked about, and so did Caitlin, about the role of exercise. And exercise doesn't mean you have to go to a gym. It doesn't mean you have to start lifting weights. Simply just going outside and walking is extremely helpful. Um, walking has been shown to reduce stress, mental stress, but also it's good for your back and your neck. Um, you can exercise at home on a ball. You can use TheraBands. Uh, you don't have to go to a gym. You can go into a swimming pool. Anything that you do from an exercise point of view is going to help. Uh, yoga, meditation. Caitlin talked about um, yoga. She talked about meditation. Some people aren't comfortable with yoga, and I understand that. But a simple thing like meditation and doing that body scan meditation, just closing your eyes, being in a dark room, taking deep breaths in and out and focusing on your neck and trap area, your back, and actually visualizing the tightness leave is actually extremely helpful. A lot of research done at Harvard has shown that not only does it help reduce muscle spasm and pain, it also actually helps your cardiovascular system by lowering your pulse and your blood pressure. Lastly, diet. Caitlin talked about diet and the role of how eating a pro-inflammatory diet and an unhealthy diet absolutely contributes to the stress in your body's physiology, which can translate itself to stress in the soma part of your body, which is your muscles and joints, which obviously can translate to pain. Change the way you eat. Look up a Mediterranean diet. Start changing your lifestyle. Exercise more. Sleep better. Eat better. And then lastly, if pain persists, get help. Here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we have a lot of experts with proven expertise and great, great satisfaction ratings that can help you. We take pretty much every insurance plan. Let's look at some of the questions. So if you've obviously scored six, eight, five, you know, you're someone who's having an issue. So in conclusion, we went over these tips and I believe Emily is going to send this to all our attendees today. Um, if you can reduce your stress, you can help reduce the stressors and the actual hormonal stressors in your body. Um, if you can adopt healthy habits in your life by not only doing stress management techniques that we just talked about, um, eating better, exercising more, you can actually have self-care options that will help you reduce and modify that stress level. Again, remember, you can't get rid of stress in life. Stress is part of life. It's how you 
manage that stress, what you do in your lifestyle that can help manage the levels of that stress, but most importantly, how that stress affects your mental being and your physical being. And as goes your mind, goes your body, and as goes your body, goes your mind. There's intimately related. Uh, next slide. So let's look at some questions. Anybody have any questions? You can type them into the section. Um, all the speakers will stay on and answer any questions you may have. Uh, there's one question from somebody who talked about CRPS and what's the best coping mechanisms for that type of pain. For those of you who don't know what CRPS is, it's called complex regional pain syndrome. It used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. The nervous system pretty much gets turned on and doesn't turn off, and it causes all kinds of chronic pain and burning pain, uh, muscle tightness and muscle stiffness. So for someone who's suffering with that, uh, I'm sure you're under medical care for that, but we talked about the coping mechanisms. The things that work the best for someone like you is exercising to intolerance, to your tolerance level, and equally important, adopting the meditation, the breathing meditation or the body scan meditation. You know, things like that can actually modulate your pain from the inside out. Caitlin, you want to add anything here? Um, no, I think those are great recommendations. I mean, there are some modalities, uh, again, for people who, you know, probably not this person asking the question who's, who's likely under care. Um, but there are other modalities with physical therapy and chiropractic, such as using a TENS unit that could be helpful as well. I'm sure that you've worked with these patients before with that. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, really focusing on some of the more mindful to, uh, stress reduction technology um, therapies are really the best way to, uh, to kind of address that. Um, for Melissa and Caitlin, there's a question regarding osteoporosis in the spine. Um, how can you help that? Um, oops, sorry. So we do see uh, many patients with osteoporosis, um, uh, weight bearing exercises seem to be the way to go, trying to put bone down um, and just getting started with a weightlifting and weight bearing exercise, whether it's running, uh, elliptical. So um, we have seen patients just for osteoporosis. Caitlin, do you have anything else to add for that? Yeah, I mean, for, if I had a patient with osteoporosis, I would recommend certainly uh, weight bearing exercises through physical therapy and um, some dietary tips and, and um, exercises even at home that you could do to help promote um, putting on bone and maintaining the bone that you do have so that you're not losing additional bone. Good answers. Any other questions? So again, um, we hope you learned a lot today from our webinar uh, regarding how stress affects your body from a structural and physiological and a mental point of view. Um, if we've given you some tools that you can certainly start using immediately. And if you're finding that you've had chronic pain and you've had chronic stress, I, I encourage you to call our center. The number is on the screen right now. And uh, Caitlin will actually intake you as a new patient and help guide you through the process of regaining your health, regaining your function, and doing the things that you love to do in life. So if there are no other further questions, I really want to appreciate everybody for attending, our speakers for speaking. Uh, we know your time is valuable and we appreciate you attending our webinar. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.